inside my office at one. Um, so my friend is doing. A deal. You ever heard of Palantir? Mm -hmm. So my friend's doing a private deal. He's working with um, some company trying yeah. to raise raise capital, and I'm thinking about investing. Would it be possible if you put that on a valuation of the week? Give me the numbers. Yeah. Okay. okay. It's, it's, it, he might not want it. That's, that's okay. the thing. Because yeah. It, you know, sure. it's, it's because if it's still in the deal making stage, okay. the VCs don't want that. What do you What do you know about it? What do you I think about it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. But I have no problem doing it. But he, okay, so it's I'll dangerous. I'll talk to him. All right. Thank you. <coughs> Okay, so just a couple of quick reminders before we start. One is there are quizzes day after tomorrow in the first 30 minutes of class. Okay? It is open book, open notes, open iPad, but no connectivity. Right? So you've got to turn off the Wi-Fi, etc. So 
the honor code because I clearly I can't be going around checking to see if you're connected or not because I have no way of knowing. So just make sure that if you're using your iPad, you're using it only as your source for lecture notes. Not even for Microsoft. You can't open up Excel spreadsheets. I mean, don't do any of the stuff in iPad that you can normally do, even if you have Office loaded or if you have a tablet. Just remember it's only for your lecture notes because that's where you, you have it. If you're not going to be taking the quiz, you need to let me know before the quiz, before 1.30 on Wednesday. Okay? So you can come in as late as 127, 128, but the minute it becomes 1.30, effectively you are taking the quiz. So, if, you know, so just let me know in time. Okay? That's about it. You know what will happen if you miss the quiz. Go, if you don't, go back and review the, uh, the original, the, the first session's notes. The syllabus actually describes what happens if you miss the quiz. Any questions about the quiz? So it'll cover everything we do through about two thirds of the class today. So it'll be everything through cash flows. When we get into growth rates, it's off the table, so it's not on this quiz. So let's start today's session with some questions about what we're going to start talking about today, which is growth rates. I mean, it's not going to be a deep question. It's just to get a sense of what our instincts are like when it comes to numbers. Because I think that we all understand the power of compounding in the abstract but most of us don't get the numbers right. So here's a very simple exercise that we can try to see if we can get the numbers, the power of compounding and the effect it has on numbers. Okay? So let's assume that you're looking at LinkedIn. High growth company, social media company, let's say the revenues right now are 200 million. Let's say you project 30% growth a year for the next 10 years, which doesn't sound exceptional, right? Given how quickly these companies are growing. My question is, if you have 200 million growing at about 30% a year for 10 years, how much money or how much revenue will you have at the end of 10 years? Just give me a guess. And I'll give you the choices. 500 million, 1 billion, 2 billion, 3 billion, 4 billion. Where do you think you're going to end up at the end of 10 years? How many think it's going to be 500 million? But the arithmetic average, that's, uh, that's where you'll end up, but this is not arithmetic averaging, right? In fact, it, I think it's what, two point, if you work out the numbers, it's about 2.75 billion. That's with 30% growth, right? If you got that right, congratulations. You got the compounding in your head, the intuition is kind of sticking on compounding. But let's say I double the growth rate, which we tend to do, right? We tend to do, what's the big deal? I'm just doubling the growth rate. What do you think will happen to the end number if I double the growth rate. It was about 3 billion with 30%. What do you think it's going to be, 60%? Higher than all It's going to be about 18 or $20 billion. And the reason I bring that home is while you're sitting there with a spreadsheet, it's easy to move numbers around. I mean, this is the trap that Elon Musk fell into, right? 50% growth for 10 years will give me 346 billion in revenues, and then you can build castles on top. But 50% growth next year is easy. 50% growth in year 10 will mean you're adding the equivalent of the entire automobile market in the US that year to your company's revenues. That's why we have to be careful because it's easy to get carried away on spreadsheets and tweak growth rates. Let's add 1% here, 2% here. What I'm suggesting is when you change the growth rate, check your end number because that's going to sober you up when you see how much you will need in additional revenues to get that extra 1% of growth. One final point, I'm going to talk about analyst growth rates today as an alternative to using historical growth. Because you look at the past, you're getting a growth rate from the past. We're going to talk about analyst estimates of growth. And if you look at Yahoo Finance or Google Finance or, or any of the, uh, the public sources, you'll often see an estimated growth for the next five years reported for your company, which comes from analysts. A consensus forecast. So let me ask you a question, because often these services are not very specific about what dimension or what measure that growth is in. I'm going to give you some choices. There's a growth rate in revenues, growth rate in operating income, growth rate in net income, growth rate in earnings per share, growth rate in any of the above, all of the above, none of the above. See my question? You see a growth rate in Yahoo Finance, given for your next five years. What is it the growth rate in, Jordan? It is, ten, I, it's in fact, that's what I best ask them to give you a growth rate in. I'll be quite honest. I've called equity research analysts and said, what is this growth rate in? 
I am amazed at how muddled the answers are. And that's a scary thought. When you don't know what you're estimating a growth rate in, how the heck am I going to use that growth rate in any other number? It is supposedly it's in earnings per share growth. And file that away, because if you're doing growth in revenues or growth in operating income, you can't just plug that number and move on. So we'll talk about analyst growth a lot, a lot more today. But those are things I want you to kind of keep in mind as we, as we start our discussion of growth rates. But before I do that, there are, f there are a few loose ends I have to tie up with earnings. Last session I talked about adjusting earnings for leases and R&D and I've been nagging you all week about doing the weekly challenge. Please do it because if nothing else, it'll bring together the mechanics of capitalizing leases and capitalizing R&D. It's not difficult to do, but there are lots of moving pieces and sometimes you can forget to move one piece. Okay? But there's one final thing about earnings that I want to kind of deal with. Remember that in each group, one of you has picked a money-losing company? So if you're the person who picked the money-losing company, just put up your hand. I, don't, I won't ask you, so don't worry. I just want Because this section is for you. This is like a, a concert, right? This is for you. So this, part, this, this particular slide is for you. The rest of you don't have to fade away, because you might have to do a money-losing company in the future. So you're sitting there. You have a money-losing company. Here's the fundamental problem you face. That negative in front is going to bother you. It's going to make life incredibly difficult. You've got to make it a positive. So to deal with money losing companies, here's the first question you need an answer to. And it's going to sound incredibly stupid and simplistic. But here's the question I need the answer to. Why is your company losing money? You say, that is obvious. It's because my expenses exceed my revenues. I know, mechanically, that's why it's happening. But the first step in dealing with money losing companies is look at the cause for the, and I'll give you some choices. It could be that your company had some kind of a temporary problem last year. I'll give you an example. Every five or t six years, Boeing reports a money losing quarter or even a money losing year. You know why? Every time it's a renegotiation with their union, they actually, it's almost like clockwork. The company was shut down. They'll shut the assembly plants down, which is incredibly expensive if you're going to kind of restart them. And that'll add another couple of billion dollars to their expenses, so you get a problem that happens once in a while. But once the problem goes away, they're back to making money. In fact, that loss is temporary in the sense that they'll make up for it in the following quarter. So it could be a temporary problem. It could be cyclicality. If you have a cyclical firm, an auto firm, a steel firm, a, a, a housing company, and you're in an economic recession, you are going to lose money, not because you're a bad company, but because of an economic cycle. It could be that you're a young company. If you're valuing LinkedIn or you're valuing a really young growth company, it's entirely possible you're losing money because that's where you should be. That's where you're in the, in the life cycle. It could be that you borrowed way too much money, like Petrobras, right? You could be making money if they had half the debt they did. So if you have way too much debt, that could create negative earnings. Or it could be that you have a structural problem. Structural problem in, the, in what sense? You're making SUVs and nobody's buying SUVs. You're producing a product that people don't want to buy and it's going to take you a while to fix that. You can't just overnight change your product and service mix. Five different reasons. If your company is losing money for some other reason, kind of bring it to the surface. Let's talk about it. But those are the five general reasons I can think of as to why companies lose money. Here are the two easy problems. If your company is losing money either because something happened last year which is temporary or because of cyclicality, you can fix it very quickly. All you have to do is take those negative earnings from last year and replace them with what I'm going to call normalized earnings. You're saying that's easier said than done. You're right. But if you're a cyclical company, I might take an average earnings across an economic cycle and plump it into the last year and say that's what you'd have made if it had been a normal year. If you're a commodity company, now you can see why it's almost an art form. You can take the earnings from last year, which could be a loss, and replace it with normalized earnings, but that'll ask, require you to make a judgment on what are normal oil prices, what are normal gold prices. But you're replacing the negative earnings from last year with the positive earnings, and everything else then flows from that. So you're basically assuming that this problem is going to pass quickly, and once it passes, the company is going to revert back to a normalized number. So that's the easy problem. 
The other three are much tougher problems because the problem is not going to go away next year. In fact, it's not even a problem. If you're a young company losing money, that's the way it's supposed to be, and you're not going to make money in next year or two years from now, three years from now. You might make money in six or seven years. If you, are, you have deep structural problems, it might take you five or six years to fix it. So these kinds of companies, here's what you need to do. You need to set a target margin that you think you can make once you get through these troubles. Again, we have to talk about actual companies. We'll talk about how to do it because we will value companies that are young companies and companies with structural problems, but that becomes the key, is setting the target margin. You have to tell me when you think you will get to that margin. So you might say, look, right now I know I'm losing money, but once I get through this stage of my life cycle, I think my margin will be 8%, and it'll happen in year 8 or 9 or 10. The rest is pure mechanics. All you're going to do is take the numbers from where they are today and kind of step up year by year towards the margin. So you're going to nurse them out of the problem over a longer period. And once you're done, your company is going to look like a healthy company. And in doing all of this, you're going to kind of have to hold your breath and hope that what doesn't, what happens to most money losing companies or many money losing companies? They go out of business, right? So when we do our spreadsheets, we're very good at bringing even the worst company back to life you're not God. Play God while you do the discounted cash flow evaluation. Once you're done playing God, you have to step back and ask, what is the chance that this company will not make it? And you've got to incorporate that into your valuation as well. So we will actually look at companies that are money losing, cyclical companies, money losing, young companies. We'll talk about the process of setting a target margin and the process of bringing in what happens if we don't make it into the valuation. But it's no different than valuing a money-making company, it's just a little more work because you've got to get that negative number into a positive number. Any questions about money-losing companies? So let's talk about tax rates. So all of this was to get that one number, EBIT, <laughs> earnings before interest and taxes or operating income. Now we have to multiply by one minus the tax rate. We kind of started on this at the start of the last session. We talked about what tax rate to use. I'll give you the choices. You can use the effective tax rate in the financial statements. Somebody who's much better versed in accounting than I am, please remind me what an effect, how, how do accountants compute an effective tax rate? What is that effective tax rate you see in a 10K or an annual report? What's it, how is it computed? Anybody? Yes? The tax expense divided by the pre-tax income? It's the accrual tax expense divided by the accrual taxable income, right? The reason I say accrual is that might not actually be the taxes you pay. Yeah. It's in the income statement, so basically it's taxes paid divided by tax. It's as simple as that, right? It's an effective tax rate, so that's the first choice. The second is I can actually compute my own tax rate by looking at the cash taxes paid and dividing by operating income. I can take the marginal tax rate for the country in which you operate. I can take a weighted average marginal tax rate across all of the countries in which you operate. Maybe the answer is none of the above, in which case you better tell me what I'm going to use as my tax rate because you can't leave me with none of the above. Or oh, this would be nice if it were true. Maybe it's okay to use any of them as long as I stay consistent with that tax rate all the way through. If, if F were true, what tax rate should we use in valuation? What's the easiest tax rate to work with? Zero. Zero tax rate takes a whole problem away, right? So if all you had to do was be consistent, then I'd just use a zero tax rate. So that can't be true. Just because I'm using the same number all the way through doesn't make it go away. So the question really becomes effective or marginal. With the cost of debt, the answer was easy. It's always the marginal tax rate because interest saves you taxes at the margin. With earnings, as I said at the start of the last session, because you're looking at all of the earnings and trying to compute the taxes you'd have paid across your income, a case can be made for using an effective tax rate, at least for the near term. It's a big choice because if I take Apple and use a marginal tax rate right from the front, I would reduce Apple's value by about $100 billion. Think about that, $100 billion. If I use the effective tax rate to begin with and push towards a marginal tax rate, I get back the $100 billion. So it's, it's not a small decision. Because as I said, most U.S. companies, the effective tax rate is lower than the marginal tax rate as to which one to use. I think a case can be made for using an effective tax rate, but here's where I pause. 
Let's say the effective tax rate for a company is 20%. Marginal tax rate is 40%. I start the process of saying, hey, you're, you're good at, at deferring taxes, so I'm going to let you have a 20% tax rate in year one, and year two, and year three, and year four. The further out I push this effective tax rate, the more troubled I get because by doing this, what am I doing? I'm building up this huge deferred tax liability, right? And I'll be quite honest, that deferred tax thing on the balance sheet, I've never been able to understand what to do with deferred tax assets or deferred tax liabilities because this is truly accounting fiction. Accounting fiction in what sense? If you liquidated the company today, you don't have to pay the deferred tax liability to the IRS. It's not a liability in the conventional sense, but it still is weighing on me because the fact that I'm deferring taxes means that this, I'm assuming that I can keep deferring taxes, not just for the next year, but for the next five years. And if I leave it at 20% forever, I'm deferring taxes forever, which is almost impossible to defend. So here's what I think you should do. Start with the effective tax rate for your cash flow. So if you're one, you're two, you're three, you're four, you're five, you want to leave it at 20%, you're okay. Starting in year five, start moving that effective tax rate towards what you think is a much more viable long-term tax rate. I used to just use the marginal tax rate of the country in which the company was incorporated as my target. I've increasingly started moving away from this because I see, especially with U.S. companies, no way that U.S. companies are ever going to pay 40% of their income in taxes because it's an absurd system where I'm required to pay 40% on foreign income on taxes and that doesn't make any sense. So what I've increasingly started doing is moving it above the 20, but not all the way to 40, maybe at 31, maybe a weighted average across the world, which is about 31% tax rates, because I think eventually all companies are going to have to pay, play by a global tax rate rule, which is going to push up the tax rates. Yes, you had a question? No? No, okay. So are you, uh Either that, I mean, what, what are the possibilities? We're talking about 10 years out, right? One is that, no, I'm assuming that eventually s something more sensible has to happen. There's no way Apple is bringing all this money back from overseas, paying the extra taxes, and continuing to pay a 40% tax rate in the new income. Because if I did that, then I have to push to a 40% tax rate. I'm assuming either that the tax code changes, which is already there's talk of it, right? Because the most recent proposal from, from, uh, from the president was that you'd lower corporate taxes to 28%, have a one-time deal where trap cash would come back and you have to pay an extra 14%, which doesn't bring you up to 40. And that from now on, on foreign income, you'd have to pay 18% of some minimum tax. So basically, there is this recognition that this existing mess that we have as a tax court has to be fixed. So I think it's going to get fixed. It's not going to be easy or clean. But I think th there's no way I see companies moving to a 40% tax rate on all of their income and paying it and continuing as U.S. companies. It's too expensive then to become a U.S. company. Right? So I am making an assumption that tax rates will move, but move towards a global average. Right? Because I think we're in this gray zone, especially with U.S. companies now, as to what to do about taxes. Any other questions on taxes? Yes, Rajiv. Well, I think the question is that, that as companies <coughs> mature, your effective tax rates start to climb. So if you look across pharmaceutical companies, the average tax rate is, let's say, 18%, but then you break them by, down by age and size. The larger companies, the tax rate starts to converge on 31 to 32. In fact, this is true across the board. As companies get larger and older, the tax rates start to move up. So that's what you're trying to reflect is it doesn't have to be 40, but you know as the, because the more growth you have, the more gains you can play in moving income. And as your growth decreases, those gains become less, more difficult to pay. So if, if the company that one is starting is fairly mature, is it just safer to keep it the same? You could, uh, but, if, but if it's effective tax rate is really low, check to see why it is, right? If it is something that is, that's a five-year Irish whatever, double sub, I don't even know what the right terms were. You know, they, they have, they, then you might say, you know what, this is not a game you can keep playing. Sooner or later, it's going to blow up in your face. So I think there's a judgment you have to make about whether to leave those taxes at 10%. Because here's what you don't want to do. You don't want to invest in these companies because they look cheap based on a 10% tax rate. 
and wake up six months from now with the IRS having issued a tax document saying you have to pay 25 percent. So you want to at least give yourself some buffer on that happening. Okay. Any other questions on taxes? So bottom line, effective tax rates much more defensible with cash flows. Yeah. Do you bother with net operating losses? I do. We'll talk about that. In fact, um, that's going to be the next page. Okay. Okay. So let's talk about net operating losses. Across the world, there is a rule that if you lose money, while you cannot claim a tax saving in that year, you're allowed to carry those losses forward and claim them against income in future years. So if you're valuing a company which has a net operating loss carried forward, you have a tax benefit. And the way most analysts value the tax benefit is extremely simplistic. They take the net operating loss and they multiply it by the marginal tax rate. So if you have a $2 billion NOL and a 40% tax rate, they'll take $2 billion times 40%. They'd say this, the benefit of it is $800 million. Let's see why that's not true. Let's assume you have a company with a $1 billion in NOLs carried forward from previous years. Let's assume that this company is expected to make operating income of $500 million every year for the next three years. So here's all I need you to tell me. Given that NOL, what would I pay in taxes in years 1, 2, and 3? And what tax rate should I use both in my cash flow and in my cost of debt? Let's start in year one. How much are you going to pay in taxes? Zero. You, you're going to pay zero in taxes, and you're going to have half a billion to carry, because the one billion carries forward. Year two, zero in taxes. Year three, you're going to pay full taxes. I'm still saving 800 million in taxes, right? But now I'm saving 400 million in year one, 400 million in year two. So the first thing I'm bringing in is I'm bringing in the time value of money, which is you don't get an 800 million dollar check from the IRS because you got an NOL. It's spread out over time. Is there any risk that I might not get these savings? Yes. Yeah. And what and what's the source of that risk? It's in whether I make the income, right? So when I discount back at the cost of capital, I'm reflecting two things. One is the time value of money. The other is, hey, I might not claim this tax saving in the first place. So my present value is going to be less than 800 million, and it's going to be a lot less if I have to wait longer and I'm a riskier company. In fact, what makes this, I think, dicey is if you have a money losing company that's still losing money, you actually have to keep tabs, not just on the NOL you're coming in with. You've got to increase that NOL each year that you lose money. And then you've got to use that NOL in future years as you make money. And that is the best way to deal with NOLs. Is rather than keep them separate, which is what some analysts do, bring it into your cash flows, incorporate it in there, and it'll already be in your value. Okay? So any questions on NOLs? So just keep track of it and, and use it. Yep. So what's the logic for applying the same discount rate to the NOL? Like because the, here's the simple rule on discount rates. The discount rate you use has to reflect the riskiness of that cash flow. Right? So if your worry about getting the NOL is, is captured in the uncertainty you feel about operating income, the discount rate you would use is the cost of capital. In fact, this is one of those few cases where you can actually argue for either a cost of capital or a cost of equity as your discount rate because you need taxable income, which is after interest expenses to actually claim these. So, but th that's, that's the tiebreaker. If somebody guaranteed me that the NOL will always bring me a tax benefit each year, then I'd use the risk free rate. So just think about the riskiness associated with whether you can claim the NOL, and that's going to give you the discount rate to use to discount the tax savings back. Any other questions about taxes? Yes, Rajiv. Right, yeah. Like if you have a lot of interest expenses, that becomes, exactly, right? Because then you have to worry about, will my equity income be high? And that's what worries me about these leverage transactions, is you borrow a ton of money, you have this NOL in there, and he said, trust me, I'm going to make a lot of money on this. That's a lot of risk that I might not make the money because if I never make taxable income, that NOL just becomes completely useless. So EBIT times 1 minus T. We're moving slowly, but we're moving methodically through the process. Next item is net capex, capital expenditures minus depreciation. Okay. Again, step back. What you're trying to estimate is how much you're putting into long-term assets in order to grow, which effectively means any time you talk about net capex, that discussion has to be connected to your discussion about growth. What scares me in valuation are people who go to the capex depreciation line items and act like they're independent of the growth rate. 
Because in modeling, that can very easily happen. You can tweak CapEx, you can tweak depreciation, and before you know it, your company can be worth twice what you think it is. So if you're going to talk about net CapEx, step back and think about the connection to growth. High growth companies will generally need higher net CapEx and low growth companies. So if you have an exceptional company, this is one of the things I will check. When you send me your, maybe your DCF is due later this month where I'll give you feedback. That's one of the things I check is if you have a high growth rate and your net CapEx is low or zero, I'm going to not say you're wrong, but I'll say what's your story? What's so special about this company that's able to, and if you have a really good story, I'll say, okay, I get it. But the obligation shifts to you when you make an assumption of high growth with low net capex. But the way I've defined net capex so is what you're putting into long-term assets in order to grow, right? So my definition of net capex cannot be based on accounting measures of capex and depreciation because they miss. And we talked about in the context of R&D yesterday, a lot of stuff that should be net capex. So when you ask me what the net capex for a firm is, I'll start with the statement of cash flows, where I have the capex and depreciation, but I'm not going to stop that. If you have R&D expenses, I'm going to do what I did last session and capitalize the R&D, which effectively means my net capex will now be my original net capex plus R&D expenses minus the amortization. If you grow through acquisitions, I'm going to count those acquisitions as if they were capex. To me, there is really no distinction between acquisitions and building your own factory. One is external capex, the other is internal capex. Acquisitions should be part of capex. So if I'm valuing Cisco, I'd be crazy not to count acquisitions as part of capex because that's how they grow. And don't let people fool you by saying we paid with shares on our acquisition so it doesn't count because again, as all you've done is skipped a step, right? That cash, if you're taking the shares issued to the market, taking the cash and bought the company, it would be in a, so all acquisitions, cash as well as stock, should be counted as part of net capex. The one thing that's always messy about companies that grow through acquisitions is they're lumpy. Basically, they can have a big acquisition year and nothing. So you can be fooled if you look at just most uh, the most recent year. So check across time. It should be in your statement. If it's a cash acquisition, it should be in your statement of cash flows. If it's a stock acquisition, though, where would you find it? You see what I'm saying? You make acquisitions, you paid with shares. It's not going to show up in your statement of cash flows because you didn't use cash. Your share count would. You would, see, but the thing is if it's a small enough acquisition, it's easy to miss because you have all these you know, options being exercised. Check the footnotes. It's a pain in the neck. You've got to go through the footnotes and somewhere in there they have to tell you by accounting rules that they did an acquisition. And here's what they'll give you. I bought XYZ company. I issued 80 million shares on June 1st to do the acquisition. So what do you have to do to complete this process then? You have to go look up the price on June 1st. I told you it was a pain in the neck. Look up the price on June 1st, multiply by 80 million, and that will become what you treat as the cost of that acquisition. And if you're wondering how much of a difference can it make, but here's an example of how much of a difference it can make. This was Cisco's acquisitions in just one year. For those of you who don't know the history of Cisco, Cisco started in the 1990s with a market cap of $4 billion. In 1999, for a brief period, it had a market cap of over $400 billion. It was the largest market cap company in the world. In one decade, it went from $4 billion to $400 plus billion. And it did it with a template of acquisitions. What Cisco did was it acquired young and promising technologies. It had a SWAT team effectively that would arrive at the company and its job is to convert the technology into a commercial product and it did it really well for a whole decade. So if you looked at Cisco's growth, you wouldn't have seen a lot of capex in the traditional sense, but it's in a lot of acquisitions. So this is just in one year. You're saying, what the heck is pooling and purchase? You know what that is? Accounting in the US used to be very dysfunctional when it came to acquisitions. There used to be two ways you could account for acquisitions. One is purchase accounting, which looks a lot like what we do today, which is if you pay more than the book value, you have to treat the difference as goodwill and show me the goodwill. The second is pooling, where you could buy another company, and even if you paid a huge premium, you wouldn't have to show it. But to do it, you had to, to qualify it, to use shares, you could not do, I mean, you had to do, jump through all kinds of hoops. But companies loved pooling because it meant that you could do big acquisitions and nobody supposedly would notice that you were doing it. So the pooling is, the, though, even though there are only three pooling, the biggest transaction for Cisco that year was a share-based acquisition. So those are the three big share-based acquisitions. The rest were cash. 
Collectively in this one year, Cisco had $2.5 billion in acquisitions. And when I did Cisco's net capex, here's what it looked like. The traditional accounting net capex was 98 million, capex minus depreciation. I capitalized R&D, which adds another billion dollars to the net capex. <coughs> I added the acquisitions, and before you know it, 98 million has become 3.7 billion. In 1999, Cisco was incredibly active on the growth front. It spent a lot of money. That's neither good nor bad. I'm not, no, I'm not punishing it. This is just the truth. When I value Cisco in 2000, I've got to factor this in to my estimates to come up with the valuation of Cisco. Okay. Yes? What if uh, a company buys another company for an undisclosed amount? How do you know? How can it be undisclosed? It's illegal. Well, it's still, you have to, you can still have, you still have to show it somewhere in, the, in, your, in your financials, right? You don't have to tell me the details of what you bought, but I have to know you either paid with cash or shares. Right, well, so I've seen a company where, like, it had a string of acquisitions, but they were all, uh, what is it called, uh, immaterial, but I think in aggregate they would be material, right? If it's like oh, they, they used an accounting loophole to get away with not telling you how much it was. That's trickery. I mean, I would not even touch a company like that. To be quite honest, if you can't tell me what it is, then I would be too nervous. To, because I, I can't even value a company if you're not telling me what you're spending, right? Uh, here's the, here's the, the other option, though. When I count acquisitions as part of my net capex, am I punishing the company or rewarding the company? It depends, right? Because it goes into my reinvestment rate, and I give them a higher growth rate because they do acquisitions. Here's my option. The company that refuses to acquisitions, I can act like acquisitions are not happening. They'll give them a much lower reinvestment and a much lower growth rate. They're going to complain to me that they're growing a lot more. And I'll say, okay, you want me to put in the higher growth rate. I need to know what you're spending to do it. Right? So maybe the best way to do this is to smoke them out. Because I cannot, what I cannot do is give them the benefits of acquisitions. It's a higher growth rate, but not putting the cost into the capex. Because then I'm getting the good stuff without paying the bad stuff. Yeah. What do you think about that approach with just in general when you're looking at any company uh, is it, is instead of trying to like quantify it, how valuable acquisitions are? Because this would only... It, it, I, it's, it sounds like an escape hatch, right? But when I do that, what am I effectively assuming about your the net present value of your acquisitions? It doesn't create a return. Zero, value. right? And if you're taking a company like Cisco, where your value is coming from acquisitions, I'll undervalue the company. If you're a company like HP, which is consistently overpaying on acquisitions, ignoring acquisitions will actually lead me to overestimate value. So for a completely neutral, zero net present value, it's going to wash out. So maybe if you do one or two acquisitions, I can get away with this. But if you do 15 every year, then I have to face up directly and say, is this value creating or value destroying? Because this is where, at the margin, you're creating or destroying value. Okay. Yes, Joe. This is probably from a couple slides ago, just a question. When you have firms that have R&D as both operating and as a capital expense, how do you, once they, they've already separated out which is mm -hmm. to classify under which? It's like capital leases and operating leases. So what do we do with capital leases? Capital leases we treat as debt. They did that already. We take the operating leases, we then treat them like capital leases. So we'll do the same thing for R&D. If they're, if they're capitalizing some of R&D, then they've already done that part. Take the remaining R&D, capitalize it, add it on top of the existing capitalized R&D, and hope and pray that you're using roughly similar approaches. And that's the problem. An accountant step in and do these things for you. They make decisions for you. They might use a three-year life rather than a 10-year life and you lose control over the process. In fact, this afternoon, I'm supposed to speak at the accounting round table. Any of you coming to that exciting event? <laughs> Come, it will be fireworks, because I'm not in a good mood today. And you put me in a room full of accountants and I'm not in a good mood, it's not going to be a pleasant sight. But it's 5 o'clock. I want to get home anyway. What's the worst that can happen? They can throw me out, in which case I get to go home earlier. So. <laughs> It's about the capitalization of leases and whether accountants are on the right path to do this, to which my response is, you should have done this 25 years ago. The very fact that you're debating as to whether to do this still is a problem. Maybe it's a problem that's telling you you shouldn't be doing this and leave it to people who are better equipped to do it. Maybe I won't use exactly those words, but <laughs> something to that effect, right? So if you get a chance, I don't know where it is. I have to find out, I guess, because I have to show up, but sometime at five, five to seven, which is a uncivilized time if you ask me, but no, I'll be there. John? Uh, if a company owns debt in, let's say, a similar company that uses similar assets. No, no, we'll back up. It Sorry. owns debt? What, yeah, what does so that mean? Let's say the 
You, they bought bonds in another company? They oh. lent to a company? Yes. Okay. So it's an investment between another company. And the company goes bankrupt, and they receive those assets in exchange for their debt. Okay. Could that be somehow translated? If they did an on-purpose full capital expenditure, could that be perhaps That's a very, a very contorted way to do CapEx, <laughs> right? Why well, lend to a company and then take, I mean, I can see what you're saying, but it seems like it's almost accidental that you got these assets because unless you're doing it on purpose, lending money like a money lender and hoping they don't pay you back and taking valuable assets, I guess it could be a strategy. Don't put it past, I mean, some countries, I would, I would you know. If that is your strategy, it's probably something you have to face up to because then the lending becomes a tactic you're using. It's the equivalent of it's a discounted capex. So what you have to treat is the amount of the loan that you actually are not being paid on because that becomes the equivalent of your capex. And the physical assets you get in return will be the assets you get. And if you're really good at this, you might end up with a really great growth strategy. Okay? But it's dancing on the edges of what I would think of as ethical behavior. But, you know, that's, uh, but I, be creative. Whatever, if there is a way to grow, your job is to bring in the good stuff and the bad stuff. What you have to make sure is that both sides show up in evaluation. Okay? Any other questions on acquisitions, capital? Let's talk about working capital. The accounting definition of working capital, remind me again, is what? Current assets minus current liabilities, right? This is something I've said before in corporate finance as well. I'll repeat it now. When we talk about working capital and valuation in corporate finance, our definition is different from the accounting definition. It's not current assets minus current liabilities. It's a difference between non-cash current assets and non-debt current liabilities. Let me explain. When you open up the current liabilities of a, uh, for a company, you'll see accounts payable, supplier credit, but you'll also see short-term debt, short-term portion of long-term debt. Take that out of the process. Saying, where is it going to go? It's going to go into debt in my cost of capital. Because in my cost of capital, I'm going to count all interest-bearing debt, short as well as long-term. I can't count it as part of working capital. So that's the rationale for stripping the debt out of the, out of the current liabilities. You can't have it in two places. Now let me talk about the cash, because this is more controversial. It's a big item. If I take Apple and I leave the cash in, think of how big the working capital is, right? It's huge. But if you step back and think about why we worry about inventory and accounts receivable, why we treat working capital as a drain on our cash, here's why. If you own a store and you go into the storeroom and it's filled to the top with inventory, why should it make you cringe? What's so bad about having a lot of inventory? What's, what, what's so bad? Because if you had less, you would have more cash that you could take it's out. Fine, but then, Pia, but you also, when you sell that, you get revenue, so. It's a wasting asset. You see what I mean by wasting asset? While it's sitting on the shelf, it does nothing for you. So inventory is a drain on cash because it's a wasting asset. You sell items on credit. You don't charge interest. It's a wasting asset. Accounts receivable are a wasting asset. Is cash a wasting asset? Or let me rephrase the question. What has to be true for cash to be a wasting asset? Sati, what, what has to be true? Let's say uh, then the cash goes away. Then you wasted a wasting asset maybe. But while it's uh, sitting there, if you have cash balance of 50, 80, 100 million or a billion, what has to be true for this? Yeah. Uh, if inflation is increasing and the value of your cash is declining. And how would that happen? Uh, Russia's. No, but remember, Russia's. that cash, is it sitting in, first let's, let's be clear. When you see cash in a balance sheet, is it sitting as currency? Or is it, where, where, where is it usually held? Money markets. Commercial paper, something liquid and something. So if your interest rate covers the cash, so right now in Russia, if you invest the cash, it's true inflation is high, but that short-term interest rate you get will have to reflect inflation. But the first thing that has to be true for cash to be a wasting asset, it is, cannot be making a fair market rate of return. Right? You think, what's a fair market rate of return? Here's a question to ask. If you or I decided to invest our money in something liquid and riskless right now, what would we make? Answer that question because to go, go take a look at your portfolio, that money market portion that you've invested in a money market fund, see what you're making right now. If the company can make that money, cash is no longer a wasting asset. See how we've lowered the hurdle for cash? Because right now cash might be making only 0.3% for a company, but that's all everybody's making. 
And if you're in Denmark, you're saying, please, God, let me make minus 0.4% and I'm OK. Because interest rates have actually gone negative there. So cash is earning a fair market rate of return. It is no longer a wasting asset. And the bulk of the cash at most companies is earning a fair market rate of return. If, the, if it's not, that CFO deserves to be fired instantaneously. Because this is the easiest thing to do, right? Yes? I know accounting for financial purposes is different, but if you're an investment bank and you have cash parked on your balance sheet, would that be considered as a working capital? An investment bank with cash on its balance sheet almost always that cash is working somewhere, right? In fact, with financial service firms, cash is never sitting around idle. They actually take advantage of us. I mean, think of it. You deposit a check now. It takes them three days. Really? <laughs> three days to, to credit me? That's how financial, financial service firms have always played the float game because they know that cash sitting as currency just destroys value. It used to be that manufacturing firms let financial firms exploit them with this, but manufacturing firms have learned to play the game, and there are more options now. You know that in the 1970s, companies could invest in banks, but banks had a cap on how much they could pay in interest rates to companies. You could invest 10 billion with a bank, and the bank was restricted from paying more than 4%. And banks loved this rule. And companies really had no choice. These were the days before money market funds and investing in T-bills and T-bonds. Cash was really a wasting asset. When I forced you to invest at 4%, inflation was 8 9 10%. So as long as you have the option to invest in financial assets and you take advantage of it, cash is no longer a wasting asset. If you're a business that needs a lot of currency, I don't know what kind of business you are, but you're probably barely legitimate if you're a business that needs that much cash sitting around. You're a Colombian drug dealer or something, you know, ask me to value. Maybe I'll count your cash as part of your working capital. But when people talk about operating cash, push them on it. Because I've seen people actually have these rules. 2% of revenues is operating cash. They'll add it into your working capital. So what do you do? What are you doing? So well, we're, we have a rule. 2% of revenues has to be set aside. 2% of Walmart's revenues is $6 billion in cash. Show me where they have six billion in currency sitting around. I'll include the six billion. But to me, operating cash has become such a small item at most companies that I'm better off just acting like it's zero and treating the non-cash current assets. So yep. Just a, a question about that two percent rule. Like I was under the yeah. impression that people used it for like retailers and just like the cash yeah. directors. And that's where even there you can see that it's starting to break down because when people paid in cash, and ninety percent of people twenty years ago paid in cash. You used to have a lot of cash in registers. People right. pay with credit cards. They pay with debit cards. It's, the game has changed, and people have not adjusted to the game. So if there's a 2% rule, it should probably be a 0.2% rule. It should probably vary depending on scale, right? Yeah. So I think if there's operating cash, ask hard questions about the operating cash before you include it as part of working capital. That's a different question. That goes back to Sati's point, which is if you have a lot of cash, then you're going to be tempted to do stupid things with the cash. So investors get heave a sigh of relief when you return the cash, saying, you know, that's, you know, we'll come back and talk about that. Why it is greater in some companies at relief and why it's smaller in others. But just because Carl Icahn says you have too much cash doesn't necessarily mean you have too much cash, because that's what he says for every company, you have too much cash. So he's not very discriminating when it comes to that. So, so you, you typically, no. do, do you apply a discount to I don't, but we'll talk about when you might want to. I would not do it across the board because I think that's too much of a bludgeon. Okay. So working capital is non-cash current assets minus non-debt current liabilities. So you, you'd be ready to argue this out, right? So you are going to run into people say, why don't we include operating cash? I want you to be clear about what the arguments are, because it's not that you should include operating cash, but the onus is on the people who want to include, include operating cash to show you how much of the cash is wasting cash. Because then I will include it as part of all. So I don't have a problem with including cash if it, in fact, is wasting cash. So as a general proposition, when you start to, I, when you start to look for this number for your company, recognize that changes in non-cash working capital are volatile. You can have a plus one billion, a minus a billion. So if you just base your cash flows on what the change in working capital was last year, strange things can happen to your cash flows. So here's my suggestion. 
when you want to estimate change in working capital, rather than looking at the change last year, here's what I'd like you to do instead. Compute your non-cash working capital as a percentage of revenues. Let's say it's 4% across time, so that you have these jumps up and down. Take the change in revenue next year that you projected for the company, take 4% of that number, treat that as the change in working capital. You see what this does? It kind of smooths out the cash with the working capital change, so you're not getting these big spikes and drops in the cash flows. In fact, what I tend to do is I have the, the industry average spreadsheet connected to my valuation. I go check to see what the non-cash working capital is as a percentage of revenues in that particular business and check against my company to see if, in fact, my company is off the radar in terms of how much working capital it has. One final point, and you're going to see this with this particular example. So three companies that are actually valued as part of the first edition of Dark Side Evaluation in 2000. One is Amazon, Cisco, and Motorola. Amazon and Cisco both had negative non-cash working capital, which means their current liabilities exceeded their current assets. And that opens up a problem. It opens up a problem because if you have non-cash working capital, it be a negative number, and you're growing, and you let the non-cash working capital grow with the revenues, it's going to become more negative, working capital becomes a source of cash. And there are some businesses where this is in fact true. The businesses that collect tuition up front and then don't pay expenses till three months later. I won't name those businesses. <laughs> the businesses that build off the fact that they get their cash paid first. And Amazon initially used to play this game really well, and it still tries, which is it got the stuff from you and I first, and then it paid the publishers two or three months later. And they were okay with it because it was a small online business and they wanted to be on there. So, Amazon had negative non-cash working capital, but in a sector where most other companies had much larger non-cash working capital needs. Retailers in general tend to have. Cisco had negative non-cash working capital, but every other company in the sector also had non-cash working capital. So basically, this was a sector where companies consistently played the working capital cycle. Motorola was the only normal company in this mix because it actually had working capital as a percent of revenues, which was a positive number. So Motorola, I basically ended up using working capital as a percent of revenues in the most recent year in my projections. For Amazon, I actually ended up using not the number that they reported as working capital the most recent year, but a number between that number and the industry average. My argument being that as Amazon grew larger, working capital could no longer be a positive cash flow, that their inventories would have to get larger because they were no longer small. I mean, Let's face it, I think even in steady state, a company like Amazon will end up having less inventory than a brick and mortar retailer. Because brick and mortar retailers need what I call is show inventory. You know what show inventory is? You go into a bookstore, a brick and mortar bookstore, what do you see? You see that whole stack of Harry Potter books in the middle, which is the only thing that people come in for. Then you have this entire stack after stack of, but nobody seems to be going to the philosophy section, the valuation section, I mean, all those sections of the bookstore. <laughs> but they have to keep books there because that's what bookstores are supposed to do. Amazon doesn't care. If everybody's buying just Harry Potter books, that's all they keep. You want that valuation book, they'll say, we'll get it written, maybe print it two weeks from now, and we'll get it to you in six months. And you say, I'm not buying this. I don't care because most people are buying the Harry Potter books anyway. So their inventory will always be a little lower than a typical retailer. So that was my rationale for leaving it at 3%. Jordan? Do you ever project that individual working capital line? So like days never. I have never, ever. Did, did everybody get Jordan's question? You've seen the accounting breakdown of working capital, right? Accounts receivable, inventory, accounts payable, deferred taxes. Don't waste your time trying to forecast, unless you have some special power to tell me how many days of receivables you see in this company for the next 30 years. Why are you wasting your time? When in doubt, aggregate. And I'm always in doubt with working capital. So I always treat the entire number because it's never been worth it to me. If you're doing short-term financial plans, then you might do days of receivables because you care. You're doing a valuation. This is noise you're throwing in for no reason at all. So I almost never break it down. Yes, sir? Let's say you have a company. I'm sorry. I yeah. Have no. Like uh, if Jose Benetti's board got acquired by Men's Warehouse, their day's inventory, I'd say, was like skyrocketing. That's a, that's a bad flag, right? So it's one of those accounting flags. That's really very little to do with working capital. It suggests to me that there's something fundamentally wrong with the operating business model for the company.
So there's no harm looking at that number and saying, hey, what's going on in the company? But it's really less about valuation and more about asking fundamental questions about, hey, what's, what's this business model? Are they giving stuff away up front, hoping to collect later on? Is that what's going on? So I think it's more a signal that you should be careful about the value you attach to the company. Right? Yes, John. It's okay, just average it out. As I said, you're doing a financial plan, you care about the fact that the fourth quarter working capital spiked and the second quarter was low. From a valuation perspective, you're just averaging things out because you care about the average cash flows across the whole year. I would worry about it. In fact, if you're going December to December to December, which is what your comparisons are, it takes care of itself, right? You're comparing peak to peak to peak to peak. So you shouldn't get, the change is what matters and you should be capturing the change anyway. Yeah? Can you explain again why you can't You can, if, if that, if, but it's got to be a very unique business model, right? So in a sense, guess like NYU, no matter how much it I'll, and I've heard businesses say, we have this great business model. The question I ask them is, are you the only one with this business model? Do you see why that matters? Because if everybody in this business is able to do this, guess what's going to happen? It's going to be a cash inflow, which is great. But since everybody has it, they're going to start competing with each other, knocking prices down. Do you see, why leave it? Because that's how you start competing. If you're the only one with this business model in a world where everybody else has positive working capital, then of course it's a huge plus for you. But if you're a negative working capital company in a sector where everybody has negative working capital, what's going to effectively happen is the fact that you have this positive cash flow cycle is going to mean that people are going to start competing on some other dimension. Okay, so right? I guess this is like a, you're basically saying there's no like free lunch here. There's no free lunch because you know, you can't, I can't increase the value of every company in a sector because it has this great working capital, because if everybody has it, then it's like nobody has it. Okay, I mean, I, I can, like a, a simple counter example would be just like if I'm running a personal like tutoring service, right. if I'm going to always be paid up front and then provide my services. And, that and let's say you get into a comparative marketplace where everybody's able to do it. So everybody does a tutoring service, is able to collect the money first, invest it in a bank account, earn 3% while money. You're going to start building it in, right? So one of the things you might start doing is cutting the prices you charge per hour for tutoring services, okay. or yeah. charge. So do but you see what? Already built in. Like <coughs> well, if it's already built in, your margin should be lower. So it's already built into. So the question is, if this is the start of the game or the end of the game. If this is a game that's already matured, then the prices might already reflect it. Yep. I have no problem giving you a positive cash flow then from that business. Now let's complete the process. All of this is to get a free cash flow to the firm. Let's go from free cash flow to the firm to free cash flow to equity. If you're an equity investor in a company, the only cash flow you ever get from the company is dividends. So the basis for the dividend discount model is everything else is illusion. Why are you wasting your time on illusions? Let's focus on what companies actually pay out. I have some sympathy for that. But implicit there seems to be the assumption that focusing on dividends is always more conservative than focusing on cash flows. And that is not true because some companies pay out more than they can afford to in dividends. And if you focus on dividends, you can get a very misleading sense of the value of equity. So even if you're a true believer in the dividend discount model, my strong suggestion to you is that you check the numbers first. Check the cash flows to see if this company can afford to pay out what it can in dividends. And that's the basis for why I compute my potential dividend. Is we know companies don't pay out what they can afford to in dividends. It's not a residual cash flow. Look to see what they could have paid out. So I have this measure that for potential dividend. But before I talk about it, let me give you some, some things I've seen thrown around there as potential dividends that should not be used as potential dividends. I've seen people discount earnings as potential dividends. It's a very deceptive argument, which is, hey, the company could have paid out its earnings as dividends. Is that true? Sure, it could have paid out. But if they did pay out their earnings as dividends, then you can't grow. So the minute you assume growth, then you can no longer assume that earnings are cash flows. One of the stupidest books ever written was this book called Dow 36,000. It was written at the height of the dot-com boom by Glassman and Hassett, two economists, and that's actually a cautionary note on why economists should not write books on valuation. So actually, this is the basis for how they came up with the Dow 36,000. They assumed that earnings had paid out as cash flow. So that was their starting assumption. They assumed that earnings would grow 3% a year forever. 
So they're assuming earnings get paid out as dividends, earnings will go 3 percent. And to top it all off, they said in the long term, stocks have always beaten bonds. They looked at the U.S. market history and that, so a long term is over 40 year period. So therefore, stocks are risk free. We should use the T-bond rate as our cost of equity. So let's bring these all together. You're paying out your entire earnings as dividends. You're growing 3% a year. You're treating cash flows to equity as risk-free. My question is, why did you end up at only 36,000? I would have got like infinity, right? But the problem here is not with the earnings assumption, right? If you assumed earnings are going to be paid out as dividends, the only growth rate that's consistent with that is a zero growth rate. You cannot have a positive growth rate. So when I look for potential dividends, I'm looking to see what's left over after every conceivable need has been met. And here's another distinction that I see people make. People draw this distinction between what they call maintenance capex and growth capex, which is fine. I understand maintenance capex is to maintain your existing assets. Growth capex gives you future growth. And if it makes your valuation more, more if you get more traction by doing it, all the more power to you. But if you put in growth into a company, then neither of these capexes is discretionary because you need the growth capex to grow. So my definition of free cash flow equity is I start with the net income. I subtract out all capex, not just the maintenance capex, all capex. I net depreciation out because depreciation is a cash inflow to me. I subtract out the change in non-cash working capital, defined exactly the way I defined it for free cash for the firm. And if I have to make debt payments, those are cash outflows. But if I raise new debt, it's cash inflow. So think like the owner with a checkbook in front of you. Every time cash leaves the firm for capex, working capital, debt payments, you have a cash outflow. Every time cash comes into the firm, it's a cash inflow. At the end of the period, what you're left with in the till, after you've met every conceivable need, I'm going to call my free cash flow to equity. It's free because it's after taxes, after reinvestment needs, after debt payments. It's a cash flow because I've added back depreciation. And it's to equity because it's after debt payments. Jordan. You would only include the debt issues if it's for general corporate purposes, though. If it's special purpose debt, then it's not actually a cash inflow to shareholders. Well, if it's special purpose going towards a mortgage. particular joint, it, it, if it's a mortgage and that asset is being used for, for put your headquarters mm -hmm. building in. Technically, it's part of your operations as well. <coughs> so the fact that it's going into a building in which your employees work doesn't mean it's any less part of operations than if it's debt going into a factory. You can ask, were those people doing anything? Should I fire them all? That's a different question about whether that. But I think if you start drawing the line between what is operating debt and what is non-operating debt, it's a very dangerous game to play. The way it's going to show up is you're taking a lot of debt for non-operating purposes your return on capital is going to plummet. So again, this is neither good nor bad. I'm just counting the debt in as part of your cash flow equity, but your return on equity is imploding on the other side. You could end up with a really bad value for your company, even though you're, you're pulling in debt each year. And also, if you're issuing a lot more debt each year than you're paying out, your debt ratio is going up, your cost of equity is going up. So that part of the table is also going to turn against you. Right? So you should or should not include inflows from special purposes? I would include all debt including special purpose debt, in my free cash flow equity, which will give me that little bump in the years that I get the debt. But if, I'm not, if that special purpose debt is, is not showing up as better earnings somewhere down the line, then I'm in big trouble because okay. it's going to catch up with me. Okay. Now, incidentally, if you, if, if you assume that there are prefer, there's preferred stock out there, take out the preferred dividends as well. Treat it as a cash outflow because preferred stockholders are not part of equity. They're just expensive debt. Yes, sir. Would you do the same with a, a feeling preferred? Yeah, I would do it for any kind of preferred. So, any kind, so just treat it like you're the guy with the checkbook, right? Whatever the reason is, you've got to write the check that's cash leaving the company. Right? Even pick that? Even, uh, we'll come back to it because I think it's, you know, you're getting awfully close to the equity component, then you've got to decide whether you're going to, if you include it as debt in your cost of capital, then even pick that. But if you decide to include it as equity, then treat it as part, it's part convertible debt. No, it's really closer to convertible debt. You might have to separate the equity portion. Okay. Now, if your leverage is stable, the equation becomes a lot simpler. Okay. You, know, you know what I mean by leverage is stable? If you're willing to assume that from this day on, your debt ratio is going to stay 30%, that 30% of your reinvestment in long-term and, and working capital, long-term assets and working capital is going to come from debt, 
Here's the shortcut. Start with the net income. Look at the equity portion of the net capex. So if you're bringing up only 80%, subtract the 80% of net capex. The equity portion of change in working capital, you have the free cash flow equity. It's a shortcut that works only if you're willing to assume a stable debt ratio. So the full assessment, which is what we had on the previous page, is the right computation. The shortcut works only if you have a stable debt ratio. So let me give you an example. In, my, in the corporate finance class, I do work with Disney. And this is Disney's free cash flow equity in, I think, 1997 or 98. The net income was 1,533 million, capex was 1,746 million, depreciation, that shouldn't be per share, so just cross out the per share, depreciation was 1,134 million. Working capital increased by 477 million, the company had a debt ratio of about 24%. So I did the shortcut. Net income minus net capex times 1 minus the debt ratio, minus change in working capital times 1 minus the debt ratio it gives me a free cash flow equity of 704 million. That's what they could have paid in dividends. They actually paid 345 million. So if I use the dividend discount model, I'm focusing on just what they paid out, but they could have paid out a lot more. But let's assume that I keep this computation as is, and I change just the debt ratio. Same net income, same capex, same depreciation, same working capital. But I try debt ratios 30, 40, 50, 60, 70. As my debt ratio goes up, what's happening to my free cash flow equity? It's actually a variation of Jordan's question because debt is now coming into the firm. My cash flows are getting pumped up. This looks like an e easy way to make your company worth more, right? Look at what my free cash flow equity does. As my debt ratio goes up, my free cash flow equity goes up. But before you decide that this is the way you should be running your company, if I'm doing this, what's happening to my equity risk, my beta? It's also going up, and that's the advantage of bottom-up betas, is there's my beta and cost of equity going up as well. So when your free cash flow equity is being pumped up by debt, whether it's special purpose debt or general purpose debt, there's another shoe waiting to drop, and the other shoe is that your cost of equity is going up, and whether the value of your equity is going up or not is going to depend on the net effect. So let me ask you, and this, is, this kind of is a review of corporate finance. So when you borrow more money, your equity cash flows get higher, your cost of equity gets higher. My question is about what the net effect is going to be. And I'll read four statements to you, and you tell me which of these is most likely to happen in a company. Increasing leverage will increase value because the cash flow effects will dominate the discount rate effects. Is that true? If that were true, every company should be at 99.99% debt, right? It could be that increasing leverage will always decrease value because the risk effect will be greater than the cash flow effect, in which case every company will be paying off debt and going to 0%. How about this one? Increasing leverage will not affect value because the risk effect will exactly offset the cash flow effect. Does that sound familiar? We gave this, that particular, we, we called, there was a theorem in corporate finance that is, see, which was? This is the Miller-Modigliani theorem. In the Miller-Modigliani theorem, the two effects exactly offset. And actually, the reality we have to face in valuation is any of those three can happen for a particular firm on a particular debt ratio. There's no way you can tell me ahead of the fact. And that's something you will have to look at in your company. Will increasing debt help me? It depends. It depends on whether the company is under-levered, correctly levered, or over-levered already, because that's what's going to drive this particular choice. So you mark on that page, because that's what we're going to do for the quiz, is through the cash flows. So now you can fade out if you want. Right? <laughs> because I'm going to start on growth at least, and I want to talk a little bit about the first two approaches of estimating growth. One is to look backwards. The second is to look at analysts. Let's start with the, what should be easy. If I asked you what the historical growth in your company is, you know why you can never answer that question? What have I not told you? So what? Over what time period? What else? In what measure? Revenues, earnings, operating income, net income, earnings per share. Arithmetic average or geometric average? I mean, oh, there are all these measurement issues. And the reason I bring this up is you take a company and you go look at Yahoo Finance, you look at Capital IQ, you look at Google, fin and you look at the growth rates they report for this company as historical growth, the numbers will never match because there are choices that people make. So I'm going to start with historical growth because this is something you see reported all over the place. You wonder how these numbers can be different for a company like Google where everybody tracks a company. 
First, I'm going to argue that your historical growth for a company will depend not just on the time period you use, but whether how you compute your averages, arithmetic averages versus geometric averages, compounding or non-compounding. It also will run into some issues when you have companies that go from negative earnings to positive earnings. If it sounds mysterious, you're going to see in a minute why growth rates become so much messier when you go from negative to positive. So let's start with the arithmetic and geometric average question. I took Motorola, one of the companies I valued my 2000 dark side evaluation. I took six years of data on revenues, EBITDA, and EBIT. In fact, in the book, I also did net income and earnings per share, two more columns, but I couldn't fit them in there. I computed the arithmetic average growth and the geometric average growth in each one. Remember, the arithmetic average growth, you just take the numbers, divide by five. The geometric average growth, you look at the compounded average. You look at revenues. The numbers are very close, right? 7.08% arithmetic average, 6.82% geometric average. You look at EBITDA, the numbers are starting to diverge. Arithmetic average is about 10.39%, 10.89%. The geometric average is about half that number. When you look at EBIT, the numbers are really starting to diverge. 42.5% growth in operating income. In arithmetic average terms, 4.3% in geometric averages. One of these numbers must be lying. Right? They can't both be right. And the easiest way to break the tie is ask yourself, what did I actually see happening in this company? You started with, what, $2.6 billion in operating income in 94. You ended with $3.2 billion. Even if I took the entire change, that's about, what, 25% growth over five years? How the heck do you end up with this 42.45% growth? And the answer is, when you do arithmetic averages, you're effectively missing the process by which earnings change over time. And you know what, what, what the driver is? See the standard deviation? The higher the standard deviation in a series, the greater the difference will be between arithmetic and geometric averages. That's why earnings per share will be even larger than for operating income. Technology companies, will you see much bigger differences than for utilities? The more volatile a series, the less you should trust arithmetic averages. Okay. So first rule, if you're going to look at historical growth rate, is make sure you're using geometric averages. You see, how will I know if I'm looking at Yahoo Finance? Don't use Yahoo Finance to get a growth rate. You can do this yourself. All you need are two numbers. Earnings this year, earnings six years ago. You're done. You put in an Excel spreadsheet, you should be able to compute your own growth rates. Don't trust services to provide you with growth rates. Who knows what they actually do to come up with these numbers. Second, the question of negative earnings. It's very troublesome, and you can see why. Let's assume that you took Time Warner, for instance, 96 to 97. In 1996, Time Warner's earnings per share was minus 0.05, minus 5 cents. In 97, the earnings was 25 cents. So it went from minus 5 cents to plus 25 cents. First, before you even give me a number, is this a good year or a bad year when you went from minus 5 cents to plus 25? Looked like you moved in the right direction, right? If you compute a growth rate for this year using just the standard equation for growth, you know what you're going to end up with as your growth rate? What's the standard equation for growth? You take the change in earnings, which in this case was 30 cents, and you divide by what? The earnings in the previous year, which was minus 5 cents, which gives you a growth rate of minus 600%. So if you did this in an Excel spreadsheet and you weren't watching, the growth rate that's going to come out at you is minus 600%. Now one fix for that is you can look at the mine and say, that's what's troubling me, put a line in the other direction, make it a plus. <laughs> We, and you can give it a, a math look and say, I use the absolute value rather than the actual value. You got away with it. No? The other is, what's the source of the problem? The denominator is negative, right? If I'd used this year's earnings of the denominator, I'd have got a 120% growth rate. The reason I bring all these numbers is I've seen people do all of these. Just change a negative to a positive because they don't like the sign. Change the denominator to the higher of the two numbers because it will hopefully give them a number. But why are you doing all of this? Because you want to get a measure of growth you can use for the future, right? I don't care about 97 growth. Why am I losing so much sleep over it? So here's the, the quick answer when you run into this kind of issue. If you have this much trouble figuring out what the growth rate was last year, don't use it in your future forecast. Just let it go. You don't need a historical growth rate. But that's something that I've seen people contort themselves, run regressions, or put in all kinds of stuff. 
to come up with a number when in fact that number is close to useless. So watch out for arithmetic and geometric averages. Watch out for <coughs> negative to positive negative. Rajiv. Um, why are you doing this on a per basis? What, what is the you could do this on an aggregate basis. I'll tell you why people do it on a per share basis. Because so much evaluation, you buy a share of a stock. So if a company is growing by buying back shares, your argument is I'm still getting the growth in earnings by holding on to the shares. I've got to give myself the reward. Okay. So if you, but I, I share your, your worries because on a per share basis, companies can look a lot better than in an aggregate basis. And especially if you have a lot of options and the number of units can shift on you, you're probably safer doing everything on an aggregate basis. But everything I said will apply even on an aggregate basis. You go negative earnings to positive earnings, the problem exists whether you do it on a per share or on an aggregate basis. Yeah. So then if, if, I just want to test, yeah. if you assume that you hold on to shares through like buybacks, buyback cycle, would you not have to put the share buyback cost in your, in your investment? Sort of no, no. Share, uh, here's a simple rule with cash flows. Cash flows going to or from equity investors will not show up in your free cash flow. <laughs> So if you pay a dividend, we don't show it as a negative cash flow. A buyback is a negative, because it's a return of cash. So if you're doing free cash flow equity on an aggregate basis, that's, that's what you have to, so that's, it will not show up in your cash flows, but it will show up potentially in your declining number of shares, and you own a bigger share of the company. That's what effectively is happening, is you get a bigger slice of the company because of the buybacks. Last point about growth. Yeah. This actually is a reinforcement of what we talked about in terms of compounding. You guys have probably have heard of Callaway Golf. They made the Big Bertha Golf Club huge hit in the 1990s. Okay? This is actually what their actual net profit did in that first part of the 1990s. Went from 1.8 million to 122.3 million, giving them a compounded average growth rate, geometric average of 102% a year. So let's say you're the equity research analyst sitting there with Callaway Golf. 1997, you look at the past, you see 102% growth. You decide to apply it for the next five years. Yeah, so easy, just put it in the spreadsheet. Just to see what happens, I put in 102% growth rate each year. This is what the net income looks like five years from now. 4.113 billion. I'm not sure what that means, but that effectively means that even people who don't play golf will have to buy three Big Bertha golf clubs and put it in their closet to beat each other up. Okay? Because it again, it's, it's a silly example, but it kind of brings home the danger of taking historical growth rates and just projecting them out into the future. And it happens all the time with modeling, because that's exactly what modeling is, right? Taking historical growth rates, pump it into the future. Just watch the numbers. Because scaling up is going to be difficult to do, especially as you get bigger in the company. Right? Any sell side equity research analysts in this? This Jordan's one. So don't take this personally. Jordan's not really not a typical sell-side equity research analyst, so he's not going to take it personally. But if you were a sell-side equity research analyst in a previous lifetime, I don't have some, I have some mean things to say about you. Okay? If you think about what sell-side equity research analysts do, the bulk of their time goes into their earnings per share number. And much as they're buying the sell recommendation, it's projecting next quarter's earnings, next year's earnings, it's a per, and it's a per share. It's a, entirely a per share game. Right? Everything's done on a per share basis. Right? And much of it is near term. So you think about the millions of dollars we spend on analysts and how much time they spend forecasting earnings. I think it's reasonable that we assume that they must do this pretty well, right? So the first question I want to ask is, are analysts' forecasts of earnings growth much better than what you'd get by just taking mechanical models and pumping them through? You know what I mean by mechanical models? Just take a time series of earnings per share projected out. How much better are analysts forecast in those numbers, or how much are we paying for this improvement in forecast? So to answer this, here's what I did. I went back and looked at a few studies. Some of these are really old, but you can get more updated studies. And I'll give you the good news if you're an analyst first. Analyst forecasts are better than time series models. That's the good news. The bad news is, not by much. The improvement you're getting is in 2, 3, 4% improvement in accuracy. So analysts spend a lot of time forecasting earnings, but most of the improvement is in the near term. In other words, next quarter's earnings, they get a margin advantage. You start pushing out one year, five years out, even that advantage disappears. 
they tend to be much better at forecasting, and this is, I think, ironic. They tend to be much better at forecasting at bigger firms than at smaller firms. Don't ask me why that happens. I'd have expected the reverse. And finally, they tend to be much better at forecasting in the industry-wide level than at individual companies. So once in a while, I end up in front of an audience of just sell-side analysts. And when I show this, they're not happy. And their reaction is, you're looking at all of the analysts, and there are a lot of bad analysts. None of them are in this room, but there are a lot of bad analysts outside. <laughs> you should focus on the very best analysts. In the sell side community, you know who the very best analysts are, right? They actually get this attached to their name after they get this title. Every year, they have these, the institutional investor has this team of what are called all America analysts. So basically what they do is go sector by sector, picking I, I'm going to say best, but I'm going to put the best in quotes, the best analyst within each sector. So these are the best of the best. And in fact, if you're an equity research analyst and you become an all-America analyst, you are golden. You've just got this bonus of a few million. You've made your, your human capital has just gone up. So the question then becomes, maybe if we focus on those analysts, they should be better forecasters than this motley crew of all analysts, right? So here's what... I did. I went and looked at studies of just all American analysts. You see, they were picked as all American analysts because they were better than the rest. And I found something very strange. If you look at the analysts who get picked for the all American analysts, they're actually a little worse than the typical analysts in forecasting earnings in the year before they get chosen. And then they get chosen, and something magical happens. The year after they become all American analysts, their, their forecasting ac accuracy improves significantly, and they go from worse than average to better than average. What do you think happens? Uh, Self-esteem Self goes up, no, and no, you become. No, no. no. <laughs> 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 yeah. The, uh, then their uh, calls have more impact on the exactly. <laughs> I told you your name from this point in time always has all America analysts attached to it. You said Joe Brown, all America analysts. You talk to everybody this way, your kids. Joe Brown, all America <laughs> analysts. Right? Listen, because and the reason you do this is very simple. You pick up the phone, you call a company, and here's Joe Brown, all America analysts. You get answered because the company wants to. This is a mutual relationship. They want to use you to kind of send information out. And they say, this guy is a megaphone. He's an all America analyst. So some of this, I know technically you're walking awfully close to all kinds of SEC rules. Let's not even go there. Because technically, none of this stuff is supposed to matter because we're all supposed to get the same information at the same time. But it does seem to cause the shift. But we do know that all American analysts have much greater impact when they put out recommendations, both buy and sell. But here's the interesting dichotomy. Buy recommendations, they get about a 3% 3, 3 jump on the day they announce a buy. And if you track it weeks later, it goes up a little bit more. So buy recommendations, the effect is, is, is muted even in the long term. Sell recommendations, not only do you get an effect, so 3% becomes actually a 2.4% if you track in the long term. Sell recommendations, there's a drop of about 5% when you make the sell recommendation and you track it months later, that's become a minus 14%. In other words, sell recommendations leave a much, lasting, a much more la long-lasting impression than buy recommendations do. Why do you think that is? They're much more like, rare. They're more unusual, right? I mean, how often do you see a full-fledged, full-throated sell recommendation from an analyst? You just saw one last week from um, the Bank of America analyst on Tesla. It's one of the it's very unusual because analysts don't want to be hanging out there. But this guy's calls are definitely not getting answered at Tesla. Okay? He's put a price range of, I think, $65 in the stock. He's, per, he's persona non grata. Now, he's not going to be on the equity research conference call the next time around. Now, but it's very unusual to get a sell recommendation. Maybe there is some information when you put out a sell recommendation, which leads me to the final point for today, and we'll come back to this. Now, I've been pondering for a while what the future of sell-side equity research is. In Europe, actually, there's an interesting phenomenon occurring, and it's going to come to the US, where sell-side equity research for a long time has been uh, it's not charged. We basically hope to make money from the side stuff that happens. In Europe, you're increasingly starting to see investment banks start to attach a price and charge for sell-side, which effectively is going to mean that if you're not supplying something that people want to buy, you're going to go out of business.
And I think here are some of the issues that I see as potential issues that cell-side equity research has to deal with before it becomes relevant again. One is I think there's a lot of tunnel vision in cell-side equity research because of the way it's structured. You go to work as a cell-side equity research analyst, you're put in a sector, and you're told, don't worry about the rest of the world. You're the cable guy. Not the cable guy who puts up the cable, but the cable guy who follows cable companies. And I think that's a, that's a mistake because I think it gives people this tunnel vision. You're the social media analyst. After a while, you lose all perspective. These 30 times revenues, that's cheap because that's all you see. Second, there's a lot of lemming items, which is you see buy recommendation show up from one analyst, you see a bunch of buys show up. If you see a earnings revision upward by one analyst, a lot of analysts follow. Because the most dangerous place to be is alone and wrong. It's okay to be wrong if you have lots of companies, so you tend to go with the crowd. Third is, and I've mentioned this, is a version of Stockholm Syndrome, which is you forget after a while that you're the equity research analyst, and you're supposed to be asking tough questions to the companies you follow. You start identifying with the company. There are a few analysts at Tesla who happen to have kind of crossed the line, and they're now hopeless cheerleaders for the stock. So they've lost all credibility. There's this unwillingness to face up to facts, or the facts that are unpleasant. You want to face up on it. And finally, and this is less of an issue than 20 years ago, is in, when the line between being an equity research analyst and bringing in business to the company gets crossed. And I call this the Jack Grubman line. Then basically there is this great danger that bias is going to feed into the process because you worry about the other stuff that you make from it. And it's not just in the US you have this problem, you have this around the world. It's sell-side equity research analysts have to worry about what investment banking business a company brings in when they make recommendations to the company. So when we start after the quiz, and there will be class after the quiz, so don't leave right after the quiz. We will continue to talk about growth, but we will talk about intrinsic or fundamental growth.